You are about to listen to Upon the Rock broadcast with Pastor Lauren Shakir of Foundation of the World Church. It is our prayer that each teaching will help build a godly foundation in your life. Please be sure to visit the church website at thefoundedworld.org for further information about this ministry and to view more teachings. Now, here is today's message. So on this day, I got a weird teaching, and when God gave it to me, I said, Lord, are you sure this is for today? (laughs) Because I recognize the season we're in, and even when it comes to our local church, I was like, okay, Lord, isn't this for a time in the future? He said, no, I need you to say this now, because I have people that are going to listen to it later, so you have to say it now. So, not saying that this message is not for you all, but... Just bear with me because I think we are prophesying to the future. Okay? The teaching I got today is called. Oh, what happened? What did I just do? There it is. (laughs) Man of God. All right. So, man of God. And I think it's important to recognize that term because when we hear the term man of God, we have an idea. We think a man of God is somebody who's up in the pulpit somebody who casting out devils or somebody who's you know doing all these miraculous signs and got all this power coming from them and they are the man of God well I want to submit to you that that is a man of God but that's just not the only man of God and so I know I got ladies here so I guess I'm talking to my men and the men that you all influence um, because I don't think enough talks have been directed towards just the man of God. Y'all hear me? Turn out just a bit, son. You're doing good. So it's, just, it's more of an educational talk, if I could say so myself. Um, I do think, like our sister was saying, that there is some kind of attack on the men, especially godly men. They want to feminize the men. Have you seen some of the commercials? Have you seen some of the things where it's like men wearing dresses and makeup and everything? Come on, guys. It's like men, just be men. Just be men. Don't try to be the women. That's why God made us different. And if I can kind of, if I if I could have like a one-on-one conversation about men. Now, You know, I don't think I'm an expert on it, but I think I have something to say. Because I have run across men who, for some reason, I guess we just haven't been taught manhood when it comes to godly things, right? So you all may pick up on this a lot more because you're growing into that. But I want to just bring out five points on what a man of God is. Just five quick points. And again, we can take the traditional approach and say, oh, man of God is somebody like Moses or Daniel, and all of that is true. But if you only limit it to those guys, then you kind of stop the rest of us. There are some men of God out there. They don't prophesy. They don't do all this, but they are men of God. But they don't know that because nobody has told them that. So I want to give people characteristics of a man of God. And if you're not a man of God, then take this teaching as a tool, as a objective. Ask God, Lord, help me to be a man of God in this area. Because a lot of us as men, if we fail in one area, we feel like we are a failure in everything. So that's why you see a lot of men, they try to push so hard to be first or to be right or be this or because they don't want to be looked at as to be a loser. And there are men who are husbands, but they're not married yet, but they are a husband. And they don't recognize that you do have what it takes to be a husband. You just are measuring yourselves by somebody else or some some other standard but if we measure ourselves by what the bible says then you will recognize that you are a man of god okay so i don't know i guess ladies just share with some of the men in your life if you don't mind let's go to the very first point is what is a man of god the bible talks about and i'm gonna give you some scriptures on this a man of god will have five different things number one is how he treats god So how he treats God. Number one, a man of God is a guy of prayer. 
he will pray. The Bible says in Daniel chapter 6, verse 1, three times a day, Daniel, three times a day, he got on his knees and prayed and thanked God, and thanked his God, just as he had done before. That's enough, son. So, you know, prayer, because I get it. My, most people say, well, I can't pray. I don't know what to say. Well, if I can kind of help men, it's not about how long you pray. It's about, are you praying? Are you going to take the time like Daniel three times a day or whatever it is the number that God has given you to take the time to just say, Lord, I thank you. Whether you wake up in the morning and you lift your hands and just say, Lord, thank you. Or, you know, before you go to bed or throughout the day, you're just communing with God. Now, prayer does not simply mean you have to bow your head and fold your hands and get on your knees. It's communication with God. And so if you're driving down the road and you just, you know, just talking to God, that is prayer. But, you know, a lot of men are not taught that. We think you have to be a, some kind of religious way and you got to say the these and the thous and you got to use all this lofty Christian language. And so people, men just don't pray because they feel like I don't I don't know how to talk like you all. But a man of God's relationship is he will talk to God. If I'm in a relationship with my wife and I never speak to her, is that going to be a strong relationship? No. So I have to communicate with her. I have to engage and I got to talk with them, even when it comes to my boys. I can be raising them, but if I never just talk to them, then it's not like, you know, we have anything to talk about or anything that I'm doing worthwhile in their lives. So you got to talk to God, even if it's small things. Number, number two is how he treats God. He will love God. Psalm chapter 18, verse one. You see that, Joshua? Keep up. Psalm chapter 18, verse 1 talks about, David said, I love you, Lord, my strength. Now, the reason why I put that in there as a love for God is because sometimes men have a problem with saying, I love you, Lord. I think it's a little bit easier for women to say, I love you, Lord, I love you, God, and it kind of just comes natural. But for men, it's almost like a, I love you, Lord. It's like a, it's like a force scene to say it. But if you get comfortable, like David's a man, he was a man after God's own heart. And he sinned all the time. He messed up, but he talks about how he loves God. And I guess to my brothers, I would ask, when's the last time you said, I love you, Lord? And genuinely meant, I love God. Not just, in, even not just saying it to yourself, but like expressing it to other people. I love the Lord. That's, a, that's kind of like a challenging thing for most men to do. But a man of God don't have a problem saying, I love the Lord. You know, I'm not going to go that way. I'm not going to say this thing because I love the Lord. Y'all hear me? All right. Another thing is seeks wisdom. First Kings chapter three talks about, so give your servant, Solomon was talking about this. Give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people or govern your family or govern this business and to distinguish between right and wrong. Who is able to govern this great people of yours? So he talks about how a man of God will seek wisdom. And I'm going to add a little bit to that. Sometimes we get intimidated by seeking God for wisdom. We say, well, I prayed for wisdom and God didn't give it to me or whatever. And then God was often, and let me kind of back up a little bit. Sometimes wisdom comes in different faces. It may come straight from God. But also, there are people that God will place in your life that are a little bit further than you, and they have wisdom in certain areas. But if you are the kind of man that don't want to seek wisdom from another man, then you're not obeying the scripture where he talks about uh, seeking wisdom. Not, okay, let me give you another example. Sometimes I have uh, couples that I'm trying to counsel, or I'm trying to talk to, and usually the woman is a little bit more open about what's going on and she will push her husband she'll say he need to be around you he need to talk to you and here you need to you know and all of these different things right and i get that but the bible talks about in james chapter i forgot it was but it says he who lacks wisdom let him ask god right he says i'm gonna I'm pause a little bit i'm gonna see how y'all say it, how y'all catch it he says he who lacks wisdom let him ask y'all hear what i'm saying that is the reason why most men stay where they're at. Their wives are pushing them. And a lot of times when I see that, I look at the wife and say, okay, I hear you, I hear you. And then a part of me is like, but let him ask. Because if he's not going to say anything, no matter how much you're pushing him, it's never going to work. And so they can come with tears in their eyes and say, but he, he just needs this and he needs that. And, and they're just really going in for him. And I understand that. But if that man does not ask himself, 
he's going to be the one that's going to be, you know, behind. In other words, God doesn't open up. That's another reason when God says, draw near to me and I'll draw near to you. You got to do some things first. And sadly, sometimes a lot of men, they just, they just, they just do it because their wife told them they got to do it. I mean, thank God for you, you know, listening to your wife, but you got to have it inside of you. And if you don't have it inside of you, nobody can put it in you. You got to have something that the Lord says, if you lack wisdom, let him ask. And that takes being humble. I particularly, and I know this may sound wrong or rude, but when I notice that a man is really not seeking wisdom or help, I don't, I don't go overboard for him. Because he's, he hasn't come to the point where he's really serious enough to ask for help. That may sound harsh, but it's the truth. Because if you don't have it inside of you, there's nothing I can do. I will be throwing pearls at a swine. So men have to eat humble pie. And if they're lacking wisdom, the Bible says, let him ask. And I take that as a life lesson. You ain't asking, nothing's going to be happening for you. All right. So that's how he treats God. But the next part is how the man of God treat others. Now, again, if some men are falling short in this area, then these are just a few points that you can ask God about, you know, prayer and loving God and seeking wisdom. So the next part is what? How he treats others. The man of God is gentle. Everybody say gentle. gentle. The man of God is gentle. He's not harsh. Y'all get it? Because you get men that say, well, I'm the man of God, and they kind of got this roughness about them. They're harsh. And they call themselves a man of God. Well, the Bible says the man of God is gentle. So what are we looking at then, right? All right, so look at 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 3. Not given to drunkenness, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. I'm going to look at that scripture because it talks about a few things we, that jump out to me is not given to drunkenness, is not a drunkard, not a person who is easily influenced by a lot of things. Not a violent person, you know, some men got a temper problem. They just, they're just, they can get, you know, wrath is actually a, a, a fruit of violence, right? But gentle, not quarrelsome or argumentative and not a lover of money. We know you got to make money, but some men get out of balance where they just, they got to go for that money. They won't go to church. They won't, they won't spend time with God. They won't do anything else because they are chasing the money. The Bible talks about a man of God knows how to find balance. We understand you got to pay bills. We understand you got to get things done. But if you are a lover of money, you are out of balance. Now, this is for Christian men. You got Christian men that's, that's doing things just like the world and they're putting a God stamp on it. Well, the Bible talks about you got to be gentle, but you also got to know how to have balance of when you're going overboard. Yes, God made you strong, but you can have strength under control which is meekness, all right? So how he treats others. If you are a person that's a mean, quarrelsome, violent person, and you're gonna, you know, you wanna quote the scriptures, but yet still you're mean, you are not a man of God, all right? And I think a lot of Christian men need to hear that because I've seen some real mean Christian men. They can quote the scripture as you, but everybody in their house is scared of them because Lightning, I'll give the illustration about lightning, is uh, back to the future, 1.21 gigawatts, right? They got a, that's a lot of power. But if lightning touched something, it'll blow the thing up. But if you take that same lightning and you place it inside of a generator or a transformer, you can turn on lights. It's power that's under control. Same power that will blow something up if you touch it. If you put it in a constructive area, it can work for you. It can turn on the air. It can heat things up and cool things down if you can use that particular energy properly. And a lot of men don't have anything that they can use it properly. So they just touch everything and they blow everything up. They blow their family up. They blow their friends up. They blow their wives up. They blow all everything up because they're, they don't have any kind of control. So the man of God is gentle. So a lot of men need to work on this. Lord, I need to have a gentle spirit about me. So far, is this good? Is this helping? The man of God is also diligent in Matthew chapter 19, verse 29. And anyone who's left house, brothers, fathers, mothers, or wife, children, feels for my sake and receive a hundredfold as much 
and will inherit eternal life. So in other words, they have a, a goal or a, a, a part about them that I'm going to follow God's kingdom agenda. You know, you, you have to have respect for people who says, I know it's going to hurt, but I'm going to follow what I believe God is calling me to do. Even if you don't agree with them, you respect them because they have a certain standard. Like with me, particularly, I'm just, I'm just using my illustration. You all can see the work that God's called me to do. And sometimes people say, well, why do you keep doing it? Why do you keep doing it? Because this is what I believe God has called me to do. So I'm diligent at it. I'm going to keep on coming. I don't care who comes. I don't care who don't come. My job is to be what God called me to be. And it's not because... Oh, I'm afraid if nobody don't come and I don't have the, the money. To, no, no, no. God says be here Sunday mornings, teach my people, film it, do all the other stuff. So that's my assignment. So no matter what happens, whether it's raining, whether it's sleeting, whether it's whatever, if I can make it here and it's safe and everybody else is safe, then I'm going to be doing what God called me to do. And so there's a certain conviction when it comes to di being diligent that everybody's not going to understand. But are you willing, men, to be misunderstood to go down the path that God has called you to go down? Or do you just fall to pieces whenever somebody don't agree with you? Some men, they just, they're like the guy who jump on a horse with no direction and just jump on a horse and he end up going in circles because he don't know where he's going, where he's headed. You gotta have a certain focus about you. This is where it comes to younger people. I see a lot of aimless men and I know they're men of God and they got their pants down and they got their tattoos and they got all the gold teeth and they smell like weed and everything. You got to have a certain purpose if you're going to start moving forward. Because you can pretend to be like the rappers or be like everybody else and you can talk like them. But is that your purpose? And we all know people like that, right? They're aimless. They think they're on track, but they're actually just copying everybody else. What did God say to you? You got to have a diligence about you that you will be able to leave house and mother. He's basically saying that you're willing to risk it all for the kingdom. Are you willing to lay aside certain things of your life to, to really catch what God has, has placed inside of you? And there's not a lot of men that I've seen. No, I'm speaking faith. We're going to see those men. We're going to see those men that's willing to drop everything to go after the kingdom of God. Now, right now, it may look a little, you know, but we're going to believe God. And I'm just going to I'm just going to set my faith right there that diligent men who are serious about kingdom. I'm not so, so much talking about uh, the church atmosphere. The church is included. But we're not talking about people who know how to put on a certain face and say a certain thing. I'm talking about real heart filled men of God that's willing to, to risk it all for the kingdom. That's what we're going to see. That's what I believe we're entering into. The diligent man. Respectful. Job chapter 31 verse 1. I made a covenant with my eyes not to look lustfully at a young woman. Why? Because men, we are drawn by what we see. I believe I'm helping somebody when I say this. Man, we're drawn by what we see and our eyes can get us in trouble. <laughs> we can. That's where pornography comes in at. You are not respecting yourself, but you're also not respecting that, that, that woman that you're looking at because she is somebody's wife. She may not be married yet, but when you lust after her, you're lusting after somebody else's wife. So that's why he says, I made a covenant with my eyes that I'm not going to look lustfully at a woman. You know, because men got this, un, they got this unspoken code. You could be in a grocery store. And you just, you know, getting some stuff and some little pretty person walk past and one man will see it and he'll look at you like, man, do you see, do you see that? And it's almost like a, a manhood, like you understand what I'm talking about, don't you? And you have to say to yourself, I make a covenant with my eyes not to look lustfully because we all know, man, we all know when, when that person walk past, the rest is looking like, ooh. But the man of God, even though he sees the same thing that every other man sees, he makes a covenant with his eyes and say, you know, yeah, she's a pretty woman, but I'm not going to lust after her. And you got to tell yourself that because if you don't, the peer pressure of manhood will have you gazing like everybody else. But the man of God will step back and say, I'm not going to go there. And you have to speak to yourself. Are y'all hearing me, boys?
You got to speak to yourself because if you don't, then you'll just be tossed and driven with every wind and every doctrine. And this is where I think men mess up. We try so hard to be accepted by our peers that we just say anything when we're around men. And you are speaking those things and it's going to produce life in you. I remember when I was uh, working at a job, my wife knows where I'm going, and um, I was being trained by another person and he was, you know, he was a cool guy. He, he did a lot of fitness and everything. But anyway, we, we stopped off at a break to, to go get something to eat. I stayed in the vehicle. He went inside. As he was going inside, well, let me back up a little bit. He he was married, but he would always talk about, you know, ooh, look at that girl over there. Ooh, look at that, you know, but he was married, right? So I stayed in the vehicle. He went inside the, uh, the, 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 the restaurant. As he was going in, another girl was coming out. And so when she was coming out, he held the door for her and he said, hey, you look good, you know, or whatever, something like that. Hey, you looking good? And he went inside to order his food. Well, the girl stayed behind outside and waited for him to come back outside. So then he came back outside and she was like, what's up? He was like, oh. He was stuck because he was he tried to he tried to backpedal. I could I saw him, he was doing all this and everything. He was nervous because she called his bluff. You know, you you said I'm attractive. What's up? You, you know, you want to go somewhere? And he, and he was like, I'm married. You know, so he had to kind of weasel his way out of that. But the fact is, he been playing that game so much that sooner or later something's gonna happen. And I think that's that's what happens when you just open your mouth and just say anything and not respecting these women of God. Sooner or later, the wrong one gonna be like, so so what you, what you want to do then? And then now you have to either feel like you have to perform or feel like you have to you know man up or whatever. But you shouldn't have put yourself in that predicament by not respecting. God's women. So that's what I mean by making a covenant with your eyes. You can get in trouble just by looking too long. So that's how he treats others. But again, it also goes to how he treats himself. You know, you you say these things or you looking at these things, you are you are actually inviting demon spirits to come inside of your your body by being in agreement with the cup of Satan. The Bible says, how can you drink from the cup of the Lord and a cup of demons too? And so, yes, there's men that are still bound to sexual addiction. And every time you yield to that, those spirits are getting more and more on you where they can produce strongholds. What you have to do, you have to start renouncing every single time. Every time you wake up, every time something triggers you, you have to, you have to speak to that. And that's how little by little it starts to, you know, you start to break free. But if you never decide to confront those things, then don't think those spirits are going to just kind of get tired of messing with you and go somewhere else. No, they're going to stay until you renounce it, until you purposely say, I don't want this in the name of you. And you start casting those things out. If you don't do that as a man of God, they're going to stay there no matter how long. It could be generations on top of generations because nobody has taken authority over those spirits. So how he treats others. I'm almost halfway there. Y'all okay? All right. So the man of God, how he treats himself. He's not easily angered or in this way, easily offended. <laughs> we got a lot of angry men out there. So a man of God is not easily angered. The Bible says, Proverbs chapter 25, whoever has no rule over his own spirit is like a city broken down without walls. If you don't have any kind of rulership over your own self, the Bible says you have no boundaries. You can go anywhere. You say, well, I'd never do that. If you can't control your spirit, you don't know what you'll do. You don't know what you'll do. So you can't say like Peter, oh, I'll never deny you. I'll never deny you. Here come that rooster. Something's about to happen, right? So you cannot just say things that you want when you can't even control your own spirit. So the man of God is not easily angered or easily offended. You know, some people, they, you know, they don't even, they don't even attend church anymore because somebody offended them. And it's something small, it's something stupid. Either the pastor didn't say something that they wanted or somebody at the church, somebody was a hypocrite. So they get easily angered and they use that as an excuse to stay outside of the will of God. That's enough, Josh. So my point is this. If you're a man of God, you're going to have to have some kind of tough skin when it comes to being offended. When it comes to be easily angered, you can't just blow up off the handle. 
I'm reminded of Nebuchadnezzar. The Bible talks about when he made that golden statue. Y'all remember he made the golden statue? And then um, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they didn't bow down to it. The Bible says that he was so mad that his face changed. And that he uh, told the strong men to heat up the furnace seven times hotter. And it says those men that bound them in, in, in the chains, because Nebuchadnezzar had wrath, and he had those men, uh, he had heated up seven times hotter. When they threw Shadrach in, it ended up burning and killing the people who were the strong men that downed them down. In other words, Nebuchadnezzar's wrath ended up killing his own team. Nebuchadnezzar's wrath ended up killing the very people who he was called to help and assist. Nebuchadnezzar's wrath caused him to get to a place where the people that were on his side ended up paying the price for it. So you think that because you're angry that you're going to you know, go into war to somebody else when you're actually hurting your own family. You know, we all seen angry men before. And if they can't control their temper, people stay away from them because they blow everything up. So you got to have rule over your spirit. All right. That's good. I know I can stay a little bit on there, but I'm going I'm to go on because I'll be there all day. He studies the word. Now, when I say studies the word, that, that could be also reading. But when I mean reading, I mean that you're reading to get something out of it. Because you can clock in time and just read a scripture and go out there and live like hell the rest of the day. No, studying the word is so you can show yourself approved. Like he says in 2 Timothy 2, so to show yourself approved to God. A workman does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. There should be a part of you that you're not ashamed that you study the word of God. Or you have some kind of time with God when you pray and you open the word of God and you just read it. Even if you don't understand it, are you taking the time to, to study the word of God? Or do you think that you're going to just grow into godly character? I believe I'm talking to men on this one because a lot of times men just feel like, well, I don't, I really don't need to read that Bible because me and God got our own relationship. But they don't open the Bible. How are you going to be a man of God without the word of God? So you got to study to show yourself approved. And notice, you're not trying to prove it to anybody else. You can prove to yourself that I, I, I know who God is because I study the word of God. Y'all hear me? And not being ashamed. We talked about that earlier. All right. Um, last part on this step. I'm going a little fast, but I think you all are catching it. Psalms 15 verse 1 talks about, or it, part of that verse, it talks about, but he honors those who fear the Lord. In other words, he, he honors his own word is another part of how he treats himself. A man of God will honor his own word. But look what it says. He honors those who fear the Lord. He who swears to his own hurt. And does not change. In other words, the man of God walks with integrity that if he says something, he's going to do it. Even if to his own hurt, even if it's inconvenient, because I put my word out there, I'm going to do it. So you got to look at that. Do you have integrity? Do you just say things and don't mean it? Oh yeah, I'll be there. I'll be there. But you ain't plan on being there. So the Bible talks about a man of God will swear to his own hurt. I don't feel like going, but I told you I'm going to be there, so I'm going to show up. You see what I'm saying? You got to have the you have to have enough integrity to take the lead. And if you don't if you don't mean it, then close your mouth. Don't say it. But if you're going to say it, the Bible says let his yes be yes, and let his no be no. Don't be like, well, I'll see what's going to happen. Mm, mm -mm. You have to really just if you're going to say it, then do it. Have some integrity, right? So a righteous man will share, will, will swear to his own hurt. And that's how he treats himself. Why? Because my word is my bond. But like we talked about in the faith series, anytime you say words like that, you are actually convincing your heart if, you, if your heart can, can be trusted in certain areas. Do you have the faith of what you are really saying or are you just saying words? Because a man will be will give a judgment for every idle word he says. All right two more points we're doing pretty good how he treats the church y'all knew that was coming right <laughs> attendance men and attendance i thank god for the women i do if we didn't have women in church it would be no churches <laughs> we all know that so thank god for the women but there's something that happens when men are in church 
is something that happens. And the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, everybody knows that one, but it says, don't forsake yourselves together. Don't forsake the assembly of yourselves together as the manner of some. Or in other words, uh, some people are forsaking the assembly. But he said, but you need to exalt one another. When, when men just show up, just showing up, it's good. Being in the house of God can also non-verbally communicate strength because men are there. Now, sometimes in our churches, we see the wrong kind of men that's in leadership and those men have been influenced by women and you can tell I mean they they move like a woman they talk like a woman they have their hair a certain way and their long earring and you a man and it's like that discourages real men because they don't want to look like no feminine man but in the churches and you said it in prayer you just be I mean I'm just saying but she said it in prayer. It's like Satan will attack the man and put this effeminate thing on the man in the church. And what it does, it runs all the other men away. Because we don't want to be like that. If that's what it takes to be in leadership, oh no, y'all can have that. I mean, some of those, some of them outfits they wear, it, I mean, it, it looked like a dress. Some of them look like a dress. I understand that may be a style, but some of that look, I mean, look like a dress. I mean, it's all tight right here, and you can see that little shape in there. It's like a, it, it's like a dress. And I'm like, how in the world you your wife let you come outside like that? That is just unreal. But they have these things, and they, you know, you can tell they've been influenced by women. They clap like women. They they do all the gestures like women. And I I think the way a man prays God and the way a woman prays God should look different. I mean, they're both praising God. But the men should not look like the women when they praise God. That's just maybe my personal opinion. Maybe you all feel the same way. But it just strikes me as something odd whenever I see men, you know, moving and gesturing like a woman. And they're in leadership. It sends the wrong message that in order for you to be in leadership here, you got to be a little feminine. And maybe that's the attack on the church. Get rid of the men. Get rid of the men of God. Let's put some of these men slash women non-binary rainbow ninjas in there. I don't know what they call them now, but they all kinds of stuff. So, attending church, just show up, men. Even if you are not, you know, it's a lot of sports that's on Sundays, but you got to take the time to attend the church. How you treat the church is a reflection of being a man of God or not. Do you put value on the house of God? Or do you think, oh, it's just Sunday, that preacher just wants your money. If you are talking against the church like that, you're not a man of God. All right. The next one is what? Lifts his hands. I like this one. First Timothy chapter 2. Therefore, I want men everywhere to pray, lifting their holy hands without anger and disputing. You know, it's like, again, going back to the thing I said before. The way a woman prays God is great. But you know when men praise the Lord and it's just genuine and they're just lifting their hands, there's something that's there. And I'm not talking about the, yeah, I'm lifting my hands. No, I mean really just lifting, locking the elbows when you lift your hand. It's, it's like, it's something that when other people, especially the younger generation, when they see men doing that, it sets something inside of them like, that's real. Now, they don't have to be doing all the other stuff like women do, but you can tell when a man loves God because he's not ashamed to lift his hands. What does that mean when you lift your hands? It means that I'm, I'm in authority, but I'm also under authority. It's a nonverbal way of saying I respect God, and it may look embarrassing to you when I lock my elbows, but I believe and I, and I trust God, so I will lift my hands in the house of God. And God says, I honor that when men, he says, that's why I want men everywhere. Not coming in like, well, I don't know this song or I don't know, I don't feel anything. So I'm just going to sit here until I feel it. No, you got to be able to lift that hand and let whoever say what they got to say. But you have to be bold to lift your hands in the sanctuary as men of God. And it will, it will change the atmosphere when men do it. Y'all hear me? Serving in the church. I'm, I like this teaching. I'm not sure about y'all, but I, I like this. 
So serving in the church, what can I do? What kind of help do you need? What can I put my hands to? Man of God will volunteer. Give me, I, you, it look like you got a few gaps here. You know, I can fix that. I can do, you know, whatever. Volunteer to serve the house of the Lord. And the Bible says you'll get a spiritual um, double scoop, I guess, by just serving in the house of the Lord. Where it says in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 13, those who have served well, gain an excellent standing and great assurance in their faith in Jesus Christ. It will solidify your faith when you just know how to just serve the house of God. That's a scripture of basically saying that if you're not ashamed to wash the feet of the saints, which is basically just serving in the church, then it will solidify and you'll have great assurance of your faith in Jesus Christ. There are some people because they're active in church their spiritual life has, 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 has gone up more just because they're just active. And they may just be sweeping the floor or may just be walk, wiping the windows or just, you know, working on sound or whatever. But whatever they put their hands to, it will help solidify their faith. So the man of God is not so much waiting and running away when somebody says, we need somebody to help stack the chairs. No, they are what you need me to do. Y'all see what I'm saying? So men should be looking for opportunities in the church to serve even if you're having a hard time understanding what the pastor is saying or the preacher is saying the fact that you are there and you got your hands on something God said I can solidify your faith just because of that but no these men today what am I going to get out of this if I'm going to drive in traffic what are you going to give me that is not the way to serve the house of God you got to have a servant's heart I'm not going to fuss. Last slide. I feel like I'm just helping men on this one. So um, this is another big thing right here is how he treats the family. How he treats the family. You got to be an honorable man when it comes to your family. A respected manager I got. That was good, Josh. You can keep going. First Timothy chapter 3, verse 4. He must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him and must do so in a manner worthy of respect. That's the key thing, manner of respect. You don't just do it just because I'm the head of this house. Y'all gonna listen to me. No. You have to lead your family like a good manager that they want to respect you. Not because they fear, oh Lord, if I don't say something, daddy's gonna, gonna break out the belt. No. It's a manner leading the house worthy of respect. Are you the bad guy in the house and everybody freezes when you walk in the room? Or are you the person where they're like, hey dad, you know, or whatever, and, and everybody's still good, but they still have a healthy respect for you. That's a man of God. And so, you know, um, like a manager, obviously, if something is wrong with the company, the CEO looks at the manager. He don't, not gonna look at the employees. If the employees are out of control, it's because they got the wrong manager. And so you have to do some training with the manager in order to fix everything else. That's how God sees it. If the house is out of control, if everybody just coming in the house whenever they feel like it, the children are wild, they watch all kinds of crazy stuff on TV, they talking all crazy and they doing all kinds of crazy stuff and you don't know what's going on in the house, the problem is the man. That's the problem. Because you let all that filth come in the house and you didn't say, no, we got standards. Or, no, we don't watch that over here. Or, no, it's about time for everybody to go to bed at this time. And we're going to wake up. At, you know, you got to set order as a manager. Not go to bed, I'll beat you to sleep. Don't do all that. <laughs> I'm talking about you got to have a certain walk about you that the whole family respects you. And God says, that's what I want. I want the fathers to be the managers that manage the household well. All right? You're doing good, Josh. Loves his wife. Ephesians chapter 5. Husbands, love your wife just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing of the water through the word. I used to get confused on the washing of the water through the word. And I think what I believe the Holy Spirit has given me when it comes to the washing of the water through the word, sometimes in a marriage, you know, the wife, for an example, they may say, oh, I think this is the right way to go. Or they think they're just having their opinion. And if the man don't say anything, it's almost like, okay, then we good. But it's that ob objection. No, 
that's not right. I don't think we should go that way. You know, when men say that, whenever, you know, everybody's planning on going this way and then you get that one man that's like, that's wrong, let's not do that. It'll stop everybody. Because it's like, how come dad said it's wrong? So the washing of the word is, is the times like if you're in tune with God and something comes in your house and you're like, this ain't right. It ought to stop everything. And it's a washing of the water through the word. And so, you know, you get, I was listening to one of my, uh, I guess somebody made a statement on uh, social media. If they're watching this, they'll know who I'm talking about. But they made a statement about, um, it was something like, um, God don't like ugly, something like that. Something like, you know, things you say in the church. And then they thought it was a scripture. It wasn't that one, but it was something like that, like how God don't like ugly. And the husband said, mm, no, I don't think that's in the scripture. And they said, yes, it is in the scripture because I remember we used to quote that. That's not in the scripture, the husband said. And they Googled it and it turns out it wasn't in the scripture. And they're like, oh. So what it does is it makes you pause and then it, it gets you to be washed by the water of the word so we can get on, on the right track, right? So men have that kind of thing of if something don't feel right, you need to wash the house with the water of the word. And when you do that, it kind of like sets everybody else to the, to the point where we're starting at the same place now instead of everything being chaotic. So he says when you love your wife, you don't just love her because she's your wife. You die for her. And then sometimes, ladies, you all can get off sometimes. We, we, we trust you. But there are some times you're not right every time. You're just not right. And you may think you're right, but the man says, no, we're not going there. And you be like, why not? And you got all the different stuff you can say. And he just stand, standing there like, that ain't going to happen. That's a washing of the water through the word. And sometimes, you know, the house needs that person that will just set the balance and say, dad said we ain't going that way. And so it stops everything. Not because he's the big bad wolf, but because... He's the spiritual head of that house, right? All right, and I know sadly there's a lot of men that are not the spiritual head. I get that. But these are just points that you can kind of work on to become the man of God. Last thing is pass down godly character. And I love this in Deuteronomy. It's actually more than this verse, but I can only fit one verse in here. But it's actually Deuteronomy chapter 6 through 12. All of it is good. But verse 7 is the, is the real meat of it. It says, you shall teach them diligently to your children. And you shall talk to them when they are, when you sit in, in your houses. And when you walk by the way. And when you lie down. And when you rise up. He was talking about, you have the ability, fathers, to pass down a godly legacy. Because the most influential person in that family is the man. Thank God for the moms and the nurturing and all this. But the one who really solidifies those children is the man. And that's just something that God designed, designed and placed on the, on, the, on the man. Now, you know one thing I recognize? No woman has any problem submitting to somebody who's doing these points. They don't. You know, they don't have a problem with submission. If you're doing stuff like this, they will honor you. And they will help you be the best man you can be. Right. And so the the uh, the family is really important because that's actually the really the, the main church that God looks at. It's the family first. Look at the family and then you can start helping everybody else. But your house has to be strong. And again, you all work together as a family unit where there's still love, there's still respect and there's still order. And God is not the author of confusion. He's a God of order. And so when you have men who respect their wives, love their wives and love their families and, and, you know, they're washing with the water of the word, God can put a blessing on that house. But there are so many men, you know, there's so many men, they just don't think it's all that important. They just say, well, you know, I'm watching the game. I'm playing the video games. Uh, y'all go do what y'all want to do. No, you are leaving your house open for the devil. And people don't recognize the danger, or in other words, they don't know, recognize the influence that a man really has in the house. That's why there's so many single parents and single this, and, and men don't want to get married because all of these different things. Those are voices from the enemy to get you out of place from being the man of God of your house. If you love the girl, if you love the woman, and you have children, marry her if you love her. Stop trying to play around like you, gonna, you don't feel like it. You're probably never going to feel like it. 
you have to just jump into the lake and start swimming. Just kick your legs and kick your arms and breathe and just start doing that and you'll end up being in the place where God wants you. But I don't think any of us has all the answers. We are trying to be the man of God that God has called us to be. And yes, a lot of them, they may not be casting out devils. They may not be doing all these miraculous things, but they are, they have these traits. They are a man of God. So I want to show you all some statistics. So what I have right here, I found this, it's a little update. That number used to be higher, but as the society goes and the husbands are out the house and the man is out the house, the Bible talk, well not Bible, some of these, uh, I think it's a Gallup poll, it says when both parents are attend church or they live godly, 72% 70, of their children will attend church when they're grown. In other words, they handed down a certain legacy that the, the children will just follow in those footsteps. When only the father attends church or lives a godly lifestyle and attends church, 55% of children attend will, will attend when they're grown. That's still a pretty good number. It's not the best number, but it's over 50%. That's great. When only the mother attends church, 15% of children will attend when they're grown. It's not that there's something weak about the woman. It's just that for some reason, people, the, the children won't follow if it's just the mother. But look at the contrast between the man by himself goes and the woman by herself goes. That's a large difference. Last one is when neither parent attends. You're going to sit at home on Sundays. Y'all going to just see if, what's going on. You're going to watch what the TV and jump in the bed and eat a bowl of cereal. Only 6% of the children will attend when they're grown. If, if no parents are going to church, you have just sealed your children that they got a 6% chance of following after that. So all of them, when, when, when God put man and woman together and he said, let them have dominion, that 70, almost 75% is a, is a good reflection. But even if it's just a man by himself doing it, following after God, then your children will follow after him. But you can't be the guy, or in this case, the guy and the girl, y'all want to sit at home on Sundays because it's dangerously, it's COVID out there. We're going to just sit at home and watch it. No, sometimes you need to get into the house of God because you're telling your children that church and following God is really not that valuable. But if you're going to just take the time, get dressed and, and get your kids dressed and wash their face and brush your teeth and we got to get out of here on time to get to make it to church, that instills something inside of them. So it does matter when we bring our families into the house of God. It sets Deuteronomy chapter 6 inside of them and when they get older, they will not depart from it. They still got to go their own way. But I like, I like those numbers better if I if I bring my kids to church and they see me walking in a godly style I like those numbers I wish they were better but I like the chances but what about the men who are out of place that feel like I don't need that God or that church thing because I don't understand all of this then you have setting your children up to, for failure when it comes to godly things you may hand down a business you may hand down a lot of things but you will not hand down the the treasure that's in heavenly places so that's my teaching, the man of God. Thank you. So, um, I don't know. I think I put that out there, obviously, because not this Father's Day, because usually I don't do a lot of messages because of a certain holiday. But this time I felt that burden that I need you to talk to the man. So my appeal is, those of you all that's watching, and you know a man that could probably use a teaching like this, share this teaching with them and you know whether they contact me or not it's fine but just get the information in them because if you're not a man of God you can become a man of God just by saying okay through this little outline or whatever these five points I'm lacking in this area this area in this area Lord help me to be a man of God in this area so the Lord will will meet you but if you lack wisdom let him ask the Bible says so you got to ask. Don't wait for somebody to push you forward. I mean, they may, they may give you the video and you're watching it just to appease them. But you're going to have to take the next step after this video is off and ask the Lord yourself 
to give me wisdom with my family, give me wisdom with the church, give me wisdom in myself and, and others and, and wisdom with God. You have to go through these things yourself and, and the Lord will add those bricks to you. But I would say, yes, you need to get around other men that are godly men that are going in that direction. But you have to be diligent in doing that. Quit waiting on somebody to tell you what you need to do and just just do it. Um, and watch God meet you when you start to go in that direction. So I don't know. I just want to just kind of tell my brothers that that um, you don't have to be an aimless man. You can be a man of God. So show that picture to them one more time. This can be you, the guy with the Bible. You probably, like I said, probably not casting out devils, or you probably not having all these different gifts at the time. But you can be a man of God right now, today. So. I don't know. Happy Father's Day to you. <laughs> Happy Man Day to you, I guess. And um, I think that's all I got to say. Amen? Y'all get anything out of that? Great. Great. What we got next? Let's do the offering. But let me, let me just pray and seal that prayer. Lord, I pray, God, for my brothers. I pray, Lord, for the men that are that's, that heard this message that's going to be moving in this direction I pray Lord right now God that you give them the insight to want to ask for wisdom let them ask for wisdom that they have the boldness to attend church and lift their hands and participate and serve and, and lead their family with diligence and even if some of them got off to a rocky start they've been a not the best father or not the best man but they have decided today Lord give them the patience they need to endure to the end so they won't give up when it gets when it gets tough that man that I'm speaking to right now that's been dragging that girl along and, and she wants to be married and she wants to start a family but he is just not serious yet Lord I ask God that you would quicken his heart right now in the name of Jesus that you would give him the mindset that you will wake him up that he is the man of God. He is the man that he's been waiting on. That you will add bricks to him. That he will um, come out of darkness. And all those spirits that's on his mind. That he'll be able to take um, aim at that. And start casting those imaginations down. Lord, I thank you, Lord, right now for the for the men that are, that are fathers. That are still trying to, you know, parent their children. Even though they don't have the relationship with the mother. That you will give them, Lord, the tools they need, Lord, to be effective fathers. That they can still pass down a godly legacy to their family. And these men that are just working and they're trying to provide. And, and they, you know, they want to do the right thing when it comes to their relationship. But they don't know the path. Lord, show them the path. Show them the path so they can to know how to get on track and be this man of God. Because they are the man of God for their house. And I just ask God right now, Lord, that they can see it in the mirror that who you have made them to be in Christ is not a mistake. And I give you praise and glory for it. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for listening to a Palm the Rock broadcast. If you enjoyed this message, please visit the church website at thefoundedworld.org for a free download. Also, please be sure to share this message with your family and friends on social media sites to help spread the word of God. Have a great week.